Welcome to the Intentionist Podcast, where we explore the interplay between intuition, spiritual health, and everything in between. I'm your host, Amy Schreiber. And I'm Hilary Zwallen. Our intention is to create a dialogue that inspires you to consciously forge your path with curiosity and compassion for life and its mysteries. Hello, fellow intentionists. It's Hillary here, and I've got a little cold, so I've got this kind of sultry voice going on today. So if you're wondering, like, what is going on with you, that is what's going on with me. Today, Amy welcomes writer Casey Main to discuss the insight in emotions like fear, seeing life as a teammate rather than an opponent, and replacing old habits using the power of emotions. Casey shares helpful thoughts on three steps needed to foster true connection with both ourselves and with loved ones, and reveals why the question why is her favorite question. And, and you know, we love those kinds of things. So here we are. Today, they discuss defining and redefining success for ourselves, managing expectations, and the power of keeping our word and taking things one step at a time when tackling big goals. They also explore vulnerability in writing, and Casey provides a window into her own journey as a writer and thoughts on writing as a spiritual practice from why religion is a difficult subject for people to discuss to the power in helpful routines like meal prepping. They cover a variety of topics and their practical applications to everyday life. Before we talk about Casey really quick, I just wanted to make a quick note to everyone that we've got a newsletter. Please check it out. And Amy and I are working on a little course for people. And I'm really excited to share more about that as we develop it. If you are new to Intentionists, Amy and I were both uh, members of the Mormon church for most of our lives. And we left about four and a half years ago. And really, that's what set us on this whole spiritual path and kind of detangling our systemic patriarchal belief systems, and kind of figuring out what is what is it that we believe now? What is it that was kind of placed upon us? And what are the good things we can take from that? So we're working on a course that is for people who are in a spiritual crisis, who are really just trying to find their footing and how by accessing your creativity, you, you can help to heal some of those wounds. So we're really excited to give you more information as that comes about. We are elbow deep in planning that. So on to our interview today, a little bit about Casey Maine. She released her debut book, I Gave Up Men for Lent, which is the story of a jaded, hopelessly romantic, health conscious party girl and her search for meaning in February of 2019. She was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida, and she enjoyed a successful career in the corporate world from public relations and healthcare sales to human resources and ops before leaving it all behind to pursue her dream of becoming a full-time writer. She holds bachelor's degrees in psychology and communications and a master's in business administration. She is blunt, honest, curious, and she jokes that she is the party girl turned spiritual junkie. So you can find her online at caseymain.com. That's www.kacie main.com and we'll turn it over to Amy for the interview. Hope you guys enjoy. Thank you so much for joining me today, Casey. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I feel like I know you really well now because I just <laughs> finished listening to your book and you probably get that a lot. I guess that's one of the perils of putting so much of yourself out there. Yeah, it's a it's a weird feeling. I've, you know, since I published it, I've run into some people that I kind of new, but you know, weren't uh -huh. super close friends. And then I'm like, Oh, you know a lot about me now. And like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, before we talk more about your book and the, the process of that, I wanted to bring up a recent blog post that you just wrote about kind of living the life you imagined versus living the life you needed. And you said mm -hmm. something I really loved at the end about how winning in life is about realizing that life isn't our opponent, it's our teammate. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that applies to our fear and resistance as well? I wanted you to kind of talk to me about how we can see fear and discomfort as our teammate in this. Yeah, absolutely. I think that fear and discomfort, even heartache, anger, frustration, anything that touches like an unpleasant nerve, there's a lot of insight in that. Because if you ask yourself, like, why am I hesitant to do this? Or, you know, why am I afraid to do this? Or why is this upsetting me? And you, and you kind of keep going down those layers of why you can learn a lot about yourself. And it usually comes down to 
some insecurity or deep rooted fear that you have. So, you know, from reading the book that mine throughout my whole life, which I only recently realized was fear of rejection. And I really believe that we all have something that is kind of at our core. It's like our, our constant struggle to overcome and it, it manifests in all different ways of our lives. But those moments of resistance or fear or, or discomfort, they kind of show you what you need to work on. And there's a, I think it's a roomy quote that I love that says the cure for pain is in the pain. So it's like, we can't mm. just ignore it and, and put it away. But instead, if, if you find insight in it, you can learn a lot more about yourself. That's beautiful. I love that quote. And I love what you talked about in your book about this fear of rejection. And you mentioned a fear around letting close friends and family see see yourself and your true feelings even more than strangers. And that's something that I struggle with. And I think a lot of people struggle with too, because the stakes are so much higher for people mm -hmm. that we we actually care about. So having gone through this process of writing this and sharing this and confronting this fear that you have, is there anything that you've done or advice that you would give to yourself now in those first moments of when it seems so intense and so scary? Yeah, I think that we're very hesitant to share our like our true thoughts or our feelings or our fears or what we want to do with our life with those around us because we haven't made peace with it within ourselves yet. And that essentially is what the book was, was kind of recognizing and then just really the beginning of starting to try and make peace with these different parts of myself that I had ignored along the way. So I think it's two levels. It's one level of recognizing like what mm -hmm. you want out of life, how you really feel, what you really think, what you believe, and then to sharing it. And you're only going to share it with others if you've accepted it yourself. So that kind of comes back to the self-acceptance and self-love, which is not easy stuff, but it's like we always have to start with ourselves. So I think if I were to go back and give myself advice, it wouldn't have been, you know, oh, sit down with your mother and have that uncomfortable conversation with her about the relationship you're in. It would have been sit by yourself and think about the relationship you're in and be honest with yourself first. That's such an important concept that I am thinking about this in a new way right now, because it is so easy to just jump to the like, let's just share with everyone, but you can't really share what you don't know or like mm -hmm. see or understand, mm -hmm. right? So that's really important, like yeah, first step. Even if you know it, and then you push yourself to share it because you're trying to push through that fear, uh -huh. that's fine. But if you haven't made peace with it, which are this two different things. It's one thing to recognize it. And it's another mm -hmm. thing to like make peace with it or to own it. Then sharing it is just going to cause all kinds of triggers for you because you might get negative feedback. And then you won't really be able to handle that because you aren't at a place of being like, yep, yeah, like that happened, or that's me, or this is what I'm doing with my life. And it, it's almost like there's a difference between kind of having a wall between you and other people in terms of you're keeping them out and not sharing yourself or kind mm -hmm. of having a little bit of a shield in terms of kind of staying true to who you are. So sharing yourself, but mm -hmm. then not letting the feedback alter who you are. Oh, yeah. So I like that wall versus like helpful shield. Mm -hmm. And then first step, see this, see the thing, see the fear, see the feeling, mm -hmm. then own it and accept it and be mm -hmm. okay with it. And then you can go share it. Yeah, I think that that's, that would be the best process. Because Awareness, in my opinion, is always the first step. I mean, you have mm. to, and this can go with other people too, like being aware how others are and then accepting how they are. Like, I think that process can be applied in all different types of life, kind of identification and awareness and then acceptance. And then that's when true connection can happen. Oh, I love that. And I loved the part of your book where you talked about like opening up and getting curious and asking questions to other people after you'd done it to yourself. And, and you talked about a time with your dad where you started asking him the why of all his life decisions. And you guys had this really, really enriching conversation as a result. So what impact since that time has the meaningful connection made in your life in contrast with this um, kind of attachment versus connection, like a fear-based attachment to maybe the idea of how someone is or should be versus like a true connection. Have you, I think you, you illustrated it really beautifully in your book. And I don't remember if that was the exact word that you used, like attachment versus connection, but mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about that. 
Yeah, it, it's funny you bring that up. I'm not sure I got into or, or spoke a lot about attachment in the book, but that's uh-huh. something I actually just wrote an article about that the other day because I think we are attached to our expectations on many levels. So both on the level of how we think life should go, but also who we think people are and their you know motives behind what they do. And for the most part, we're just guessing. They're all assumptions based on you know what we think of this person, but we're essentially doing to other people what we don't want done to us. Like we don't want other people, you know, assuming who we are or our motives behind things, like based on our mm-hmm. actions. So we only uncover the truth if we start talking and, and asking people. And I just, why is my my favorite question right now, and probably will be forever, because I think that's the most interesting part of people and of, of life. And unfortunately, we're, we're not talking about the whys a lot. Like mm-hmm. conversations typically, you know, they're very, you know, who, what, where, when, but the why is like the intention behind things, which can reveal a lot about a person. And then the how is great too, because that's the process. I mean, everything is a process. We are in process. And so I think that when you discover those hows and whys about yourself, and then you start asking them of other people, and you have conversations where you're sharing all of that, and that can only happen when everybody has an open mind to things. So they're no longer attached to, you know, beliefs and and expectations and everything. There's just more of an openness. That's when like real connection happens. And Unfortunately, I think especially now in today's, you know, political environment and then with social media, we're very polarized and we're very closed minded and Mm. we talk at each other instead of with each other. And it's very much a I'm right and you're wrong and I'm going to explain to you why I'm right and you're wrong versus a this is what I think. You know, what do you think? Oh, it's different. Interesting. Like, let me hear more about that or let me explain more about what I think. I don't it's like we're attached to being right. Mm hmm. That's yeah, that's a really great thing to remember. And the why, like, I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed listening to your book so much, because you did, t- you talked a lot of details, like this happened, and then this happened, but it really wasn't about what happened. It, it really was about the why and the thought process. I haven't had a very similar life experience to you, but I have had similar thought processes. And because you were so open with that, and so mm-hmm so forthcoming. It was inspiring. Like I was inspired by your honesty. And also I think that people, when they go through these uncomfortable moments of, of asking the why of themselves and come to the uncomfortable realizations and try to distinguish like the voice of their true self from their, all their conditioning and stuff. Mm -hmm. I think people feel alone in that a lot. It's something that feels like very solitary, even though it's something that people go through, you know? So thank you for sharing that. Like, I, I think that's such an important thing. I love that you said that because I agree. And I think, and that's part of what enabled me to put the book out there is I originally shared like the first draft to, you know, a couple close friends. And then I, then I sent it to more friends and then I sent it to some family members. And I just started to realize that while I told my story, it's really very much a universal story, not the day-to-day stuff and the relationships and the circumstances, but the deeper struggles, because I think we all struggle a little bit with identifying who we are versus all the different roles that we play. And, you know, I, I played several roles of, you know, a daughter and a sister and an aunt and a girlfriend and a friend and all that stuff. But, you know, everybody plays some kind of a a role in their life. And it's very easy to get wrapped up in that and almost lose your identity. And I think that we all struggle with kind of the path that's been laid out before us based on the, the little inner world that we grew up in, you know, kind of this is what everybody does and this is what everybody knows and this is what's quote unquote normal. And so we don't tend to think outside of those norms because we're just surrounded by it. And then it's it's hard to do that. And 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 then the relationship stuff, I mean, we've all lost ourselves in relationships and, you know, made mistakes or, you know, wish we would have done things differently. And then there can be a lot of shame and guilt in that. And I think everybody who has probably had some kind of a, I don't know, one of those moments with your parents when you're 
becoming a young adult and you're kind of trying to stand your ground of, you know, I'm an adult now, although, and you know, you act like you've got it all figured out, although you don't really have it all figured out, but you still <laughs> like don't want to be seen as a child anymore. So, right. and I think we don't share a lot about a lot of that because we're ashamed of it and we think it defines us. And so a lot of the feedback I've gotten from the book is similar. That's like, Oh, I, it was nice to have somebody put that out there because I felt this the exact same way. And so hopefully then people do feel less alone. Yeah, I I loved to the quote that the Neil Gaiman quote that you put at the very beginning of your book about yes. what is it? Yeah, it's like if you if you feel like you're walking down the street na- naked, like bearing too much of yourself, that's the moment you might be starting to get it right. And you know, I think that goes back to that vulnerability of being who you are and then, you know, leaving a little bit of the herd mentality of how you live life and and going and doing what feels right to you, whatever that may be. And it's, it's scary. But again, I think the fear, there's insight in that fear. So, you know, maybe it's, it's scary because it's different, but also because it's right for you. That's a wonderful touch point. Like that's the wonderful thing about fear because mm-hmm. I'm, we, me and Hillary actually were talking a lot about this in our discussion yesterday, just about how fear tells you you're on to something. That's what it's there for. It tells you you're doing something big enough. Mm -hmm. I think all of our feelings are. I read in some book, I I can't remember which one it was, that our emotions are like our internal guidance system. So they show you kind of what direction you're moving in. And then I think the uncomfortable ones can show you what direction you need to go in, but not necessarily a don't go here, more Mm -hmm. of a you've got to work on something you know, to be able to go down this road. And so I think if we pay more attention to how we feel, which is difficult these days, because we're so busy, and like, we all have ADD in terms of, you know, emails and texts and social media and everything that we've lost a little bit of touch with ourselves and our emotions, which I know was the case for me leading up to to writing the book. But also I think life happens along the way and you get hurt and then you don't want to get hurt again. So you kind of block out some of your emotions and, and then we, for one reason or another, end up in this place of that we're not experiencing a lot of like real true emotions. And I think that's why there's such a need for self-reflection or some kind of quiet time to try and get back in touch and figure out like, how do you really feel about your life? That's a really helpful way to view emotions. So along with your quiet time, like just trying to connect and be quiet in yourself, are there any other strategies or or signposts that you use to distinguish like, yes, this is my true self, my intuition versus no, this is my conditioning or this is something else? Like, how do you view your intuition now? Like, is there any tools you could share? Yeah. So I ask myself why all the time. So, and Mm -hmm. I will, instead of just immediately reacting to something, and I'm by no means an expert at this, I still, I still struggle with it, but it, you know, in everyday conversation and everyday life, if something, you know, upsets me, I try and first notice that feeling And then start to analyze it a little bit before I react like, okay, why do I feel this way? And, you know, maybe it's a justified feeling, or maybe it's just hitting some kind of insecurity that I have that I need to deal with. And I don't necessarily need to react outwardly because it's, it's my stuff that, that I've got to work on. And so I think that just that first level of awareness is key And I heard, um, it was Eckhart Tolle in an interview, I think it was on Oprah's podcast. He talked about how, you know, if you're aware of your feelings and your thoughts and they're, they're both fleeting, like feelings will come and then they'll go. So the more you're aware of it, the shorter lifespan it'll have in you because like your awareness of something and the thing can't exist in the same place for too long. So the more you're aware of like your negative self-talk, like the less you'll do it because you start to kind of create some space and separate yourself from it, if that makes Mm. sense. Yeah, no, that does. And that reminds me too of the Untethered Soul book. Yes. What's his name? Robert Singer? Uh, uh, Michael Singer. Michael Singer. (laughs) Yeah. He talked about when you're open, like, and and you're seen, you're transparent to your feelings and what's going on, then they can flow through you and they they don't stick and, and cause issues. Yes. So that book I carried around in my purse after I read it for months. And right now I have it on loan out to a friend. But 
that, I mean, he talks about things uh, really from like an energetic standpoint, but that helped Mm -hmm. me kind of conceptualize in my mind feelings and maybe what I had done over the years in terms of, you know, heartache and negative feelings coming up. And I didn't want to feel that way. And, you know, I wanted to be, oh, I'm fine. Like I'm a, you know, I'm a strong and I'm an independent woman and, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'll get through this. But I wasn't really processing them. Like I wasn't letting them go. I was just shoving them down. And then that stays within you and kind of cycles through. And then you can get into these like bad negative patterns. So it's not a matter of denying yourself negative emotions. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of like recognizing them and then letting them go. But I think you can only let them go if you understand where they come from, which is kind of going back to the finding insight and all the uncomfortable stuff and like asking all the whys. So asking yourself the series of questions, do you often do that like through writing or just in your head? Mostly I do it in my head. Um, Mm -hmm. I am, I'm a big fan of journaling. Um, but ironically I don't do it, (laughs) right? (laughs) But the book was essentially journaling and that's kind of the only Uh time I've, I've journaled in my life. But now when I, now when I write, it's, it's more, you know, kind of in an, in an article or a blog type form. So I try and right. analyze whatever thought I have going on or even whatever situation I just went through. And instead of, you know, journaling out into a journal, I try and write it into an article that I can then, you know, put somewhere, you know, on the internet or blog or whatever. So I don't journal, but I do believe in it because it's a very safe space to confront yourself because mm-hmm. not everybody, you know, has to turn it into a book and, and publish it. Uh, but it can just live, you know, in a notebook or on your computer. And you, if you start to stop yourself from saying what you want to say, there's a lot of insight in that moment too. And that kind of triggers you to realize, okay, I'm, I haven't accepted my own thoughts and feelings yet because I'm not even willing to put them down in my journal, which is private. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think if you, it, it all comes down to, I think, awareness and being really honest with yourself, which is difficult to do, but, but journaling can help with that. So I, yeah, I would say like asking yourself why, um, and maybe giving a little bit of space before you react to things so that you can ask those whys and kind of figure out, figure out, is this my own work? Like, is this just hitting something in me that I can address? Like, is this showing me, you know, where the the pain is or journaling to help just better understand how you process like thoughts and emotions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. As you're, as you're talking about journaling, I'm, I'm remembering that I have had such a resistance to like journaling lately. And I usually like to write, but that, yeah, that tells me that there's some, some stuff I don't want to deal with right now. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that Which is, that is helpful. And, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's why I'm, maybe that's why I'm not journaling. Um, you know, I'm not sure, but we're just, we're all in process. And I think if we cut ourselves a little bit of slack and cut everybody else a little bit of slack, like we can all kind of like, just stop for a minute, take a deep breath and, and just accept the fact that we're in process and that's okay. Like that's, why we're here. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to live up to the expectations we put on ourselves or that, you know, we feel society or our family or our friends are putting on us. Like we're here, I believe to just be us. And that's like an unlayering process because we all have all these layers of fears and insecurities and attachments and, you know, issues that we've got to sort through. But I think that's, that's the point of all of it. That's the why behind why we're here. I agree with you. And I'm glad that you brought up the uh, emotional aspect and how emotions and thoughts and other, and beliefs, all, all these things, but especially emotions, they cause these habitual patterns of behavior. And that's the second thing that I wanted to, to pick your brain on is habits and reversing negative ones, um, creating positive ones. So a lot of your book was about this, you becoming accustomed to this certain way of spending your time and thinking about your life and relationships. So tell us the story of kind of just what prompted you to reevaluate everything and what in general kept you on track as you tried to make these like behavioral changes and these mental changes in mm-hmm. your life. Well, so what I think really prompted me is that I just got to this space of I, I say in the book, um, feeling bleh, because that's kind of the only mm-hmm. way I can describe it. Like I didn't feel sad, but 
but I didn't feel happy. I think I had gotten to this point where I wasn't, I wasn't feeling much about anything. I wasn't feeling super inspired or energized in my life. Um, but I wasn't, you know, super depressed. Like I wasn't crying all the time. So I just felt like off and it's mm -hmm. difficult to describe, but I think that anybody who feels that way will immediately kind of know what I'm talking about. Like, I just, I didn't feel like I was connected to my life and like really living it. So that's really what prompted it. And then throughout Len and throughout the book, I, you know, I start to change a lot of my just daily routines. And that was, you know, basically because that's what I had committed to for Lent. So um, for the listeners who haven't read the book, I gave up men, but then I also gave up social media, sweets and hard liquor. And my reason for that was, you know, I've historically been a little bit of a party girl and a, a bar scene person. And I just wanted to kind of slow that down. So I really, I kind of stopped going out and I started spending a lot of time, you know, I would walk on the beach and I started listening to, you know, YouTube videos that were inspirational and Ted talks and podcasts. And I mean, this is very normal for some people, but for me, it was nothing I had ever done before. If anything, I had mm -hmm. almost mocked all of the, um, you know, personal development or, or self-help type stuff. So I just, I spent a lot more time alone and just thinking, and then also writing and, to be completely honest, I probably only stuck with it for the 40 days because I had committed to it. And, you know, I mm -hmm. didn't even do the greatest job sticking to it at all times. But, and then afterwards, it just, I felt different. Like I could just feel the difference. Like throughout Lent, you know, I just, I wanted to, you know, listen to more podcasts or, or Ted talks. And I wanted to go for a walk on the beach and, you know, I, I wanted to spend an entire day writing versus day drinking and, or watching TV and, and it felt good. So it's like, it was very much like a breath of fresh air. And I'm not going to say, you know, that I, I had that Lent spirit and then, you know, completely changed my life forever. Like after that was done, I still kind of teetered a little bit and I would fall back to my old ways, but then I would feel the difference. So it's like, I just got a lot more in touch with my feelings. And I think that is the strongest way to break habits because that's how they were formed to begin with. So if you start to do something different over time, you kind of train your brain to associate that activity with a different feeling. And if it's a better feeling, then it's easier to make those decisions of I'm going to do what I know will make me feel better tomorrow versus what I think will make me feel better right now. Mm, yeah. And the other part that I think you illustrated so well in your book was your feelings around the identity that you had wrapped up with the behaviors. Like it was a major part of how you identified yourself mm -hmm. in the party scene. And then the person who makes fun of personal development stuff, you yes. know, and that's, that's <laughs> such a hard, that's such a hard thing to, to look at and overcome, I think. So I loved, I loved how you showed that in your book and how you came up against like the, the identity aspect of it. Yeah, because I think that if if we lose touch with who we really are, which I kind of did slowly along the way, and I think that can happen to a lot of people, then it's like we fill that void with, you know, all these external roles. And mm -hmm. and I I had kind of found that that party girl identity when I was in college and it worked well for me and I felt accepted and liked and and fun. And so, you know, that that worked for me for a long time until it all of a sudden didn't. It's like until I just, I became more aware of the disconnect from the life that I really wanted, but I don't look back and like regret those years at all. And this is where I think, you know, going back to we're all in process and I very much believe mm -hmm. every step of the process is a necessary step. And it's so easy. And we live in a world right now where we're just big on looking at certain events or chapters of our life and being like, well, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. If I would go back, I would do it differently. But I don't know that that's how we should be viewing it because everything we've done brought us to this point. And I love where I am now. And, you know, had I not gone through all that, and I had a lot of fun in my 20s being the party mm -hmm. girl, you know, I wasn't aware of what I'm aware of now, like it really did work for me then. So I don't view it as a mistake. And so I think that kind of comes back to the just the self acceptance of recognizing 
you know, we are who we are and, and that's okay. Like we're okay just as we are, which I think is, is a big thing that I also tied into my relationships of like, I, well, I need to be in a relationship almost because like I didn't see myself as whole. And so then entering any relationship, you know, with that going on in my mindset, it's, it's not going to be a healthy relationship. And, and they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely a, a great point. Yeah, well said. <laughs> well said. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you. So, so you used Lent, despite you. You mentioned you were raised Catholic, but not very religious. But you mm-hmm. used Lent as this sort of container for a shift. Can mm-hmm. you tell me a little bit about like your spiritual practice? now and like do you take kind of taking what is useful from a belief system and leaving the rest like do you do this in other ways just tell me a little bit about that yes so um yes I was raised Catholic Catholic school grade school into high school um and my mother hates it when I say this but I I was never really a very good Catholic but I I was always a little (laughs) bit intrigued by it and I just like I went through phases, like there were a couple times in college where I went to church. I didn't really tell anybody. I like snuck off and went to church, but it, it didn't really give me what I needed. And I think the biggest shift for me from a religious and spiritual standpoint was kind of taking what's in the Bible um, or any religious text that that you want and deciding for yourself how you feel, like analyzing it yourself rather than just accepting how it was taught, like really looking at it and thinking, okay, like, what does this mean to me? Like, what are all the other like different things that this could mean? And that now it it goes back to like being curious with other people. So now I'm, I'm very curious with really any and all religious, you know, belief systems, because I think there's, there's truth in all of them. Like there is like little gold nuggets of information in all of them. So whatever it is, it's almost like you can think of it as like a writing prompt. So in the writing world, a lot of times, like I use quotes as writing prompts for me, or I listen to podcasts and somebody will say something and then that's a writing prompt for me. So it's like, if you, you take different things that you find interesting or intriguing from whatever kind of religious umbrella you want and then start to think about that yourself, that to me is, I guess that's my spiritual practice these days, is really analyzing a lot of different teachings and trying to find like what rings true to me, where are they maybe all saying the same thing, and kind of sifting through like the man-made rules and, and dogma portion of it, and trying to get to like the root of the actual teaching. And I think it's it's that root of all the teachings that is always something beautiful, but we, Mm -hmm. you know, we're human. So along the way we've, we've kind of messed things up. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's, that's a really nice way of looking at it. The whole getting to the essence of it and then using the concept as a sort of life prompt, like in Mm -hmm. like a writing prompt, with writing, do you see writing now as a sort of spiritual practice for you? Definitely. Yeah, I, I definitely do. And and that's actually kind of where I hope to maybe go a little bit with my writing is I'd love to really learn more about different, you know, religions and find where they intersect and then kind of take those concepts and apply them to everyday life. And, you know, how does it play out and, and, where can it help us? Or sometimes maybe where can it hurt us? I just, I love the the intersection of different religions and then how, how does that actually play out in, in day-to-day life? Because sometimes, you know, you can talk about this stuff philosophically and it all sounds great, but then when it comes down to, you know, an argument with your boyfriend or, uh, you know, an issue with your coworker, it's all of a sudden harder to really realize, okay, so what should I do in this situation? Um, so I like trying to to take those broader philosophical ideals and maybe put them in slightly more um, everyday terms. Yeah, the practical application, that is definitely like what we're trying to do with with this podcast and something like you were talking about before, how how being open and curious with other people, I think that's in religion, that's another area like politics that's so divisive yes. and so needed like exploring it with compassion but also calling it out when needed you know mm-hmm. just seeing it for what it is and and 
figuring out what is helpful. So anyway, I, yeah, I really, I remember we talked before about your blog post about that. Yes. It's really, it's, it's fascinating to me how difficult it is for people to have conversations regarding religion. Um, Uh If it's within your kind of your, your like-minded group of people, it's fine. But as soon as you start to branch out and, and have a conversation with somebody that maybe has different beliefs, like people get very, they can get very defensive. They can get very judgmental. Um, some people like won't even talk about it. And it's really weird if, if you think about it because their beliefs. And so it's like, you know, I have my beliefs and you have your beliefs. Like, why do we have to believe the same thing? Like mm-hmm. we're, we're taking that very personally for some reason. And maybe it goes back to the fact that we're using that as part of our identity versus just something that we connect with and, and believe in and want to practice. So I love, I'm very curious about all all religions. And I I love having those conversations with people, but I found most people don't want to have those conversations (laughs) with me. And so for the most part, I don't bring it up, but I do, I do find it all, all fascinating. Yeah. I do think the identity piece that you just said is the key to why people are so uncomfortable and not wanting to examine it. But yeah, I mean, the most, the most interesting and probably best conversation I've ever had was on an airplane when I was a really believing Mormon. Mm -hmm. And I was like 21. And I I was sitting on an airplane next to this guy getting his PhD in philosophy, atheist type person. And we just talked the whole time about like, (laughs) religion. And it was because we were both I could tell he was not coming from this place of judgment or Mm -hmm. or anything. And I wasn't I was in a place not feeling super attached to like, yes, I have to be right in this moment, Mm -hmm. which before I generally had. But yeah, I mean, it it showed me that, oh, people can talk like people can talk, you know, and that's why like I I love the just even the name of your your podcast. I told you this in our our pre-conversation because I I think it all comes back to intention, like your why behind everything you say or do, like, that's what matters. And I think that's what most religions are really talking about. But we've, we've taken a lot of that and we've applied it to, you know, the everyday stuff of, you know, you know, what you do and what you say and how you act, not kind of the, the why behind it, because mm-hmm. um, in, in y'all's recent episode about the teachers, you know, you're talking about these teachers that are, you know, they're preachers or they're, they're running big churches and they've got all this incredible stuff to say, but then, you know, they're doing this other stuff on, on the side that, that maybe doesn't fall in line with what they're teaching. So that kind of goes back to like, what is their intention behind what they're teaching or like how they're living their life. And I think that's what really matters. And, and some of the most interesting conversations I've had regarding this were with my really good friend, April, who's in the book. And I used her Uh real name because she didn't care because she grew up very, very Pentecostal, which I didn't Mm -hmm. know anything about that world. So we just started talking about it. I'm like, Oh, that's so interesting. And then we started it and she was having her own issues with it and kind of trying to find her own beliefs. And so we just started analyzing things that she was taught. And then what are maybe other ways that you can look at it? And so ultimately, so many of our conversations stem back to your intention behind everything you do is either fear based or love based. Like it's that simple. Like you're either coming from a place of love or you're coming from a place of fear, which essentially is your ego. And I think, um, you know, I'm I'm a little bit familiar with the Bible because that lives in in the Catholic world. But so much of what Jesus talked about was, you know, love and and fear and. I think it really is that simple, yet we've made it super complicated. Yes, it's our own faults, like most of the time, mm-hmm. which is one of the hardest lessons, I think, to to see like what things we're holding on to that makes that creates so much more suffering than is necessary, like in all these different areas. Mm-hmm. So something else I wanted to talk to you about. So this month, our theme kind of was success through steady and consistent cultivation. So, so discipline, just the little steady work. Um, and you having tackled some major goals, you published a book for one, that's huge. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about the process of, of a disciplined practice, but also defining and redefining success for yourself? 
Yeah. So the, the disciplined practice, I think I do, I do okay with, I'm not, I'm not great with, but for me, it comes down to two things. One is honoring your commitments to yourself. So like doing what you say you're going to do, which, which is difficult. So, you know, an example I experienced this the other week, like I was going to go work out. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do like this workout. That's what I like went into the gym telling myself, this is the workout I'm going to do. Of course I get, you know, one third through it. I'm like, Oh, this is probably fine. I start to argue with myself. And it's so easy Mm -hmm. in those moments to talk ourselves out of like what we said we were going to do. And I just started saying to myself, no, like do what you said you were going to do. And so in those moments of kind of weakness, where we start to veer from kind of staying on track of whatever disciplines we've laid out, bringing it back to that bigger concept of staying true to yourself, like honoring your commitments to yourself, I think is a, is a really big one. And then the second one is as cliche as it, as it is, just take things step by step. It's so easy to look at, you know, kind of the distant future of what we're trying to do, you know, no matter what it is, you know, maybe it's, you know, writing a book, or maybe it's losing weight or, or whatever it is, any kind of goal that we have, we look at kind of the end result. And then we start to freak out like, Oh, my God, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to do that, because this obstacle is going to happen. And this mm-hmm. obstacle is going to happen. And But the fact of the matter is, is you're not encountering any of those obstacles at this moment, nor do you really know that they will exist. Like you're just guessing. And so it might not be true. So if we really do just only ever live in the current step and kind of just think of the next step, it makes it so much more manageable. I mean, that is the only way I got through writing the book, because had I, in the process of writing it, started to think about everything that I was going to have to be doing like today in terms of trying to promote it, I very easily could have freaked out and been like, this is too big. I'm not doing this. But instead it was mm-hmm. just like, nope, like I'm writing it. So that's all I'm doing right now. So, you know, both that staying, to, staying true to like your own commitment. So just doing what you say you're going to do essentially, but like for yourself and then only taking things step by step are, I would say my two biggest pieces of advice for, I guess, being successful and whatever success means to you. And then as far as success, I mean, that's definitely something that I still struggle with because it's so easy to define success in very, I, I don't know, like societal definitions. So I'll get you know, a book Mm -hmm. sales report and, you know, I'm not pleased with it. And then I just, you know, spiral into all this doubt and fear and failure because it's like, that's what I'm using as a success definition. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. It's so easy to forget. I did publish a book, which was a huge goal of mine for all of my life. So why isn't that just a success in itself? Or then sometimes I'll get like a message from somebody who read the book, who I don't know, telling me like how much it made them feel less alone, or they really loved it, or they felt better, or they felt inspired or whatever. And then that message that should outweigh any and all, you know, sales report that maybe isn't what I want it to be, but it doesn't always. And so that's, it's very difficult because, and that kind of goes back to, you know, you have these bigger concepts of, oh yeah, I'm so happy that I'm positively impacting somebody else's life. Yet I also have bills to pay. So, you know, it's kind of like, how do you take right. the the bigger stuff? And then, you know, when it comes down to like living everyday life, they don't always coincide. And that's where I think sometimes it comes back to just trying to live in the current moment and the current day and just take life, I guess, even just step by step, because just because I got a disappointing mm-hmm. sales report today doesn't actually mean I'm not going to be able to pay my bills next month. Like, I don't know what's coming. So kind of that trusting that life is on your side and, you know, the Michael Singer um, philosophy that, you know, um, the surrender experiment in terms of that life does know better and you should just surrender to it and start saying yes to whatever it brings. And so I, I definitely, it's a long answer to say, I definitely still struggle with that, but I'm, I'm trying to work on removing some of the everyday success metrics and focusing on the bigger picture, um, you know, that I, I did check off a huge goal. And even if my book only reaches a handful of people, but it changes the lives of those handful of people in a positive way, that's a huge success. Well, and it, you you creating it changed Mm -hmm. your own life too. Like 
aside from whatever monetary success you may find from it. I love what, um, have you read the book Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott? I know, I, I don't know her, but I know of her. Um, but no, I have not read that. Oh, it's such a great book. She talks about being published and how there's this idea that publishing something is what's going to give people like who write what they're looking for, but it's the writing that gives them what they're looking for, the process, not so much the result of publishing. It's called Bird by Bird because she gives the example of her brother trying to do a school project the night before it was due about a bunch of birds and he hadn't started it yet. And her dad just sat with him and said, you just have Mm -hmm. to go bird by bird. It's just step by step by step, you know? So that's such a, that's such a amazing reminder that, yeah, it is like, it's, it's said all the time, but it's worth repeating all the time because it is so essential (laughs) to like our mental well-being. To remind yourself of, you know, on a day-to-day basis. Like it is, it is very hard, but that's so funny. You mentioned that book. Cause actually I think somebody else recommended that book to me a couple of weeks ago. And so little stuff like that, like now I'm definitely going to read that book. Cause I'm like, Oh, okay. This, like, the universe uh-huh. is clearly <laughs> telling me like, you might want to read this book. So I try to pay attention to little like synergies like that. Cause I do believe that the, the life is always talking to us and, and it does no better than we do. So if you kind of trust it and pay attention, you know, that's maybe where our true path lies. So Another kind of related side note on on a different type of discipline. In your book, you mentioned that you used to do weekly meal prep for lunches. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to my husband about that this week and trying to figure out what he should do for lunch. And he was like, no one really does that. No one does meal prep that like no one sticks to that. I was like, Casey does. Casey does. (laughs) So I wonder, do you still do that? How long did you Um, do that? (laughs) I got out of it for a little bit because what what I'll do is I'll make the same thing every day, which is fine for me for a while. Like I'm not a huge Uh foodie, which is I'm fine eating the same thing every day. Um, But then like after a couple months of it, then I'm like, oh, God. Um, or something in my daily routine will change. It's like when I when I left, I left my corporate job to pursue writing. Right. Um, I think I got out of it a little bit because I wasn't you know, taking my lunch to work every day. But I, it's funny you say that because I just got back into it the other day. And I really, when I was doing it consistently, I loved it, not just from the fact that then all of a sudden you have your lunches made, but also it like mentally prepared me for the week. So it's like, I would do it every Sunday and I had it down to just like a tea. I knew exactly what groceries I was buying. And then, you know, I had all my little Tupperwares. And so it was this whole process. And then it, it's almost like people talk about like a, like a bedtime routine, both for children uh-huh. and then even for adults. Like if you want to um, have a good night's sleep, you kind of set yourself up for bedtime. It was like my setting myself up for a productive week. And so I, I really... I I think it works on both a physical level in terms of um, then you've got your healthy lunches made. And so you're, you're covering yourself for lunch, but also mentally, it was kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm ready for this week. Like I've got this. That's cool. Yeah. So it's, is there something like that, that you do any writing rituals that you do? Because that's a major, major leap into like a discipline, like a self-motivated discipline to, Mm -hmm. to leave your corporate job and fully pursue your dreams. So how do you, how do you set yourself up for, for that? Yes. I mean, that's, that has been such a learning process too, because I, it's like, I've done everything backwards. Typically people, you know, start writing, um, and they gain a following and they get kind of a, a, a number of freelance things going, and then they publish a book because they already have like a following of Uh people. Um, I did it totally different. So I published a book and then I'm now trying to get some like freelance writing going. And so I, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing in any realm of it. I, I don't know anything about marketing a book. I didn't know anything about publishing a book. I didn't even really know anything about writing a book. And if anything, it's just proof that you re- we really can do whatever we want to do. If you just figure it out kind of one step at a time. So now I feel like I'm just now getting into a better groove of, of writing consistently. Cause I wasn't for a while. Cause I was like, Oh, I've got to, you know, I've got to do all these social media posts and I've got to do this. And I've got to do that. And, and then I just started to realize almost like what you were saying in that book, that it's like the, the writing is, is the therapy for me. And that is the purpose for me. And that's what I, I think that's my contribution. So I have to keep writing. So 
now I'm in a better like morning routine of, you know, workout um, and then write initially because I found that I'm more creative or in more of a writing mood earlier in the, in the day. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a morning person. I just, I, I have been for a long time. Not everybody is and, and that's fine. There's been studies out there that will show like some people are more creative at, you know, late at night or, mm-hmm. you know, in the middle of the afternoon or whatever. But it's like, if you start to goes back to like starting to pay attention to how you feel, you'll figure out kind of when you're feeling the most energized and like, when are your lulls? So now I'm trying to get writing in during those times that I know I'll feel most energized and then do some of the, I don't know, like different stuff when I'm in a lull, like scheduling out social media posts, or, um, I probably need to do more of like my accounting stuff. Um, but it's just, I'm, I'm kind of just now figuring out that groove. And so I think for, for everyone else, it's a matter of finding what will, what will work for you. But I do think that whether you're a morning person or not, morning routines are extremely helpful, just like a bedtime routine is just like my Sunday routine of meal prepping to get ready for the week. It's kind of, and this is where it's so funny. Cause like we were earlier talking about how routines and habits can be negative, but then I think in certain realms, they can also be very positive. Right. Yeah. And I love that you bring up to listen to yourself and try to to understand when you can be most creative and productive. That's like one of our favorite things to talk about the whole principle of working with yourself versus against yourself, working with the season versus against the season. There's all these things and there's all these cycles that happen. So paying attention to them is is how we can maximize our our time and our efforts. And that is like the beauty of good habits is it's their energy savers. And they like, we have more time and energy to devote to like our work and what we're creating and stuff. Yes. There's this great little book um, by Heidi Hanna and it's called uh-huh. uh, recharge. And she talks, when I read it, I, I bought like several copies for all my friends. Cause she talks about how everything is cyclical. So you know, you'll go up and you'll be super energetic and then you're going to come down and you've got to recharge. So it's like, if you go, 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 you're going to burn out. And I think that, I mean, I've certainly experienced that in my own life and in different jobs along the way, but also just on bigger picture type stuff. So everything has seasons and everything has cycles. So I even try and pay attention to like, okay, I'm in a writing cycle. Like I'm, I'm feeling like I've got a lot to say. I'm feeling like I'm, I'm able to put the words together how I want to. And so I've got to ride that wave essentially and like go with it. Mm-hmm. And then I'll go through time periods where I'm, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. And you know, there are some schools of thought that would say to push through it and write anyways, but that kind of goes back to I, my personal belief is, you know, you're either working with life or working against it. So to kind of trust mm-hmm. that, you know, maybe I'm not in a writing mode over these, you know, certain couple of weeks, but that's okay. Maybe I'll be super productive doing something else, like planning out different marketing strategies or, you know, maybe coming up with events or, or who knows, but just that paying attention to yourself and to how you feel and to life in general and what it's presenting to you. And really just, you know, going with the flow, like that cliche saying, like so many of these sayings we say all the time, but then you know, when you really think about it, you're like, oh, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we've come full circle back to your working with life instead Mm -hmm. of against. That's it's such a great helpful way to look at things that seems obvious, but it's really, you know, it's really amazing how much we try to fight against what's going on. So what is next for you? Are you involved with any other projects that you would like to make us aware of? Yeah. So I, I'm going to be launching my own podcast actually. <gasps> so Yay. yeah, I'm going to join the podcasting world. Um, I've got that in the works and I'm, I have no idea at what point it's going to launch, but it's going to focus a lot on like our relationship with ourselves because I mean, a lot of what we've talked about today, I think so much of it comes back to that. And we kind of live in this world where it's easy to point fingers and blame, but that's really kind of pointless because, you know, when you're, when you blame other people, you're, you're giving away your power and we can only control what we do yet. We focus so much on, you know, what other people are doing. And so I wanted to really focus a lot on better understanding our relationship with ourselves so that we can become better versions with ourselves, which falls in line, as you know, 
kind of the purpose that I that I figure out within the book is is to make life better. And so it's not mm -hmm. saying that there's anything wrong with any of us, but we can always be better. Like there can always be a better version of us. So that's what I'm hoping that it'll really it'll really focus on. So I'm not sure when it's going to launch yet, but it will be coming. Oh, I love it. That's exciting. So tell before we sign off here, tell everyone where they can find you online and your book and all that good stuff. Yeah. So my uh, website is caseymain.com and that's K-A-C-I-E-M-A-I-N. Um, and all my socials are there. So I'm on um, Instagram, which is caseymain underscore right, like W-R-I-T-E. Um, and Twitter is the same. And then Facebook is caseymain.right. Um, and the book is available on Amazon. It's also an ebook form on Kindle and audio form on Audible. And that book is I Gave Up Men for Lent. Is that the right title? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Casey, for coming on the podcast. And I really enjoyed talking to you and wish you well with all your future endeavors. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And thank you for reading the book or, or listening to it. I know you you spent like six hours listening to me. <laughs> I did. I did. And it was fun. Like, like I said, it was really, it was really exciting. And I, I found myself cheering for you like the whole time because, because you would mention during the book, like your thought process of I'm, I'm going to write this book and I'm going to write this book. And, <laughs> and I'm like, yes, but you did it. You did it. Like, cause I'm here listening to it. I was so excited for you the, the whole time. So that's awesome. Thank you. Before we part, we'd like to say thanks for listening, and we hope you'll connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We would love to hear from you and appreciate all feedback, shares, and likes. To learn more and subscribe to our newsletter, visit intentionists.com. And no matter where you are or what you're creating, we send you love and invite you to breathe and begin. See you next week.